Okay, we're back. We had a we had a few problems there getting things uh, hooked up. We've we had to quickly jump on a plane and fly all the way from Australia back up to Ontario in Canada, and uh, we've got Lloyd here. So I hope everybody's ready for a presentation related to structures. So. When you like to do research and gather photos for modelling, sometimes you will like to see how this covered bridge came about. Lloyd's going to do a little uh, clinic on his latest project. And so also from Ontario, Canada, with his fifth clinic on NMRAX. So he's, he's getting up there. Uh, we'd like to welcome uh, NMRAX's own Lloyd Henchy. So Lloyd, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Marty. Um... This is not basically a clinic. It's mainly a, like a presentation of how I did, uh, how I built my covered bridge. So to get started, uh, let me just share. Okay, so welcome everyone. Before we start uh, discussing the uh, Kantukuk covered bridge. Let me tell you how I got to this point. Uh, in 2014, we bought a house bigger than what we were looking for and then ended up with a basement with no furniture to fill it. So at this point, I told my wife that the basement would become my retirement project with model trains. Having no knowledge of this hobby, never having a train set, and not being on a train that I can remember, um, research was of importance. While looking at pictures, videos, and lurking in forums, covered bridge were very scarce, which made the decision of having one a must. I had just started uh, building my layout uh, when I came upon plans for a covered bridge and started building it from scratch in 19, uh, 19, in 2017. And uh, ended up with this covered bridge. It was okay, but uh, it wasn't to my liking, especially when I, di when I decided to go for my structure achievement program for my MMR. Um, so four years later, after the build, after the build, which brings us to 2021, I came upon another set of plans, pictures, and a video of what was to become my new covered bridge. The covered bridge in question is called the Kantukuk Railway Covered Bridge, and it's the oldest railroad covered bridge standing in the U.S. It is found in Merrimack County in New Hampshire. But before we go into details of the build, uh, let us look at the, the history of the bridge. In 1848, Concord and Claremont Railroad was chartered, was chartered to build a 60 miles line, which included a few bridges through Kantukuk River Valley because of numerous saw, grist, and silt mills and silt mills. Because of damages by ice, water, and sags in the center, the bridge needed to be dealt with and rebuilt. In 1888, the bridge was taken over by Boston, Maine, and rebuilt in 1889 with double web town lattice trust and used till 1962. As of today, the bridge still stands and is one of the uh, eight surviving covered bridge in the US. The Kantuka covered bridge was meant to stay as it went through a flood in 1936 and was knocked off its footing. Again in 1938, it was knocked off its footing because of a hurricane. Both times the bridge was hauled back up, in, uh, up onto its abutment. In 1955, the passenger service ended and the freight ended in 1962. It was then used as a warehouse until 1989. 
In 1989, uh, the state of New Hampshire took ownership of the bridge for maintenance and preservation. And here's another picture of the bridge as it stands today. So we will now look at the prototypical built of the covered bridge in HO scale. Um, while doing some research, I did find a company selling the same covered bridge for almost $300 US. And I also met two people who also scratch built the same bridge. It's a small world. And it was, it, it was, um, it was very interesting to meet the other two people that from, built from scratch. I was able to find pictures and plans of the bridge at the uh, Library of Congress. The plans were detailed and I was able to bring them in Photoshop and scale them down to 187. Once the work done in Photoshop, I then printed the plans so I could have a template for the construction. Next, I had to make a list of all the scale lumber needed. Um, and that's where my, I guess my background in civil engineering uh, came very useful because I was able to come up with exactly the, well, not exactly, but yeah, exactly the, the right amount of lumber needed. And um, I got all this lumber from Mount Albert scale lumber. So I first started with the walls, each wall has 12 layers, uh, four layers of double web lattice and eight layers of cord. I take the printed plan on the, uh, of the wall down and build on top of it using carpenter glue for each piece. This is uh, once, uh, this, this one here, this is basically when I was finished doing the four parts of the wall. So you've got um, two double lattice and uh, two double uh, cord. Um, and now all I needed to do was to assemble everything for one wall. So this is what it looked like after the wall was completed. I needed to assemble all four pieces to create one wall and then repeat the whole process for the other wall. Once assembled, I applied the stain to the wall structure. Uh, the stain I use is Unterline. Um, I can't remember which, um, anyways, it's a dark, um, it's, a, it's a dark stain. This is the inside of the actual bridge at this time. Uh, and the state has ownership. So the tracks were removed and there was planks put in the middle for people to, um, yeah, it was the fact that it was used as um, a, a warehouse. Um, so the tracks were, were already gone. So the inside of the walls, um, had, uh, had boards at both ends on each side. Uh, that's the top picture on the left. Um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't done uh, completely all inside. There was only like a small section on both sides and both ends. The outside of the wall was done in two sections. The bottom part was about four feet ten inches and the top part was about 12 feet, 10 inches. For the boards, I used double-sided tape from Scotch to secure them to the frame. Um, it was much faster than having to put glue on every piece, uh, on every board. Um, and for those who wonder if it was sticky, it was very sticky because once you put the board in, um, I tried to remove some of them and they were really stuck. So it's a, it's a good way of gluing things, I guess. Um, but all the boards were pre-stained uh, again with uh, underlying stains. 
and you can see at the bottom uh, bottom right the two walls were uh, completed that way uh, again as a, uh, an actual picture as you can see the two layers of the siding Next was the roof. Uh, again, I take the printed plan and build on top of it. I started with the tie beams and the exterior rafter beams. It was much easier to work with the plans uh, that way. And going back to the Photoshop of like bringing it down to scale, um, what I did is I took the drawing and scaled it down so I can just barely see each end of um, of the floor, and I knew that I knew what the the measurement was. So that's how I scaled it down to 187. I then uh, added the central rafter beam with the diagonal roof brace. Now the fun part. Uh, <laughs> The diagonal roof braces were notched, and so were the rafter ends. That was that took a long while. Uh, I had to do, cut them exactly where um, where the rafter beams were, um, but everything fit properly and made everything very strong. Um, so, uh, like I said, they were um, they were not not notched at uh, one end so they could sit on the exterior rafter beams. Those are very tiny pieces when you're doing it to scale. Um, I then added the boards along the entire roof. The, the rows were staggered from each end. Like you can see from the top picture um, where the pieces were staggered every second one uh, were staggered and uh, the right picture is basically the roof that's completed now i had a hard time finding uh, how the roof was done and i finally got i finally got the answer that it was um the metal roof was basically sheets of metal. Uh, so the flat metal roof was built in two pieces uh, using the Scotch double-sided tape with strips of one by two basswood to create the joints in the panels and heavy duty aluminum foil. So I decided to do the metal roof uh, away from the wooden roof, uh, just in case I kind of screwed up. So I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't gonna touch the roof until that part was finished. So I first drew my vertical lines uh, for the ridges on a piece of paper. And then I used the Scotch double-sided tape to cover the entire sheet. Uh, I then added my um, one by two basswood. And once completed, I then added the aluminum foil and used Q-tip to remove all the creases. Um, I mean, I, I could have bought something different, but I ended up doing it like scratch. So this is what the, the roof looked like before paint and weathering. So you've got two pieces, like I said, I did two pieces um, separately and then added it to the roof. Um, there was no pictures of the roof, the actual roof. Uh, so it's hard for me to come up with some weathering and I'm not as good as Ralph. <laughs> uh, so I had this picture and I said, okay, that's, that's what I'm going to look to make it look. Um, that's what I'm trying to, uh, the final, to get the final result for that roof. Um, so I, I found another roof on the internet, the picture and of metal sheets. Uh, so I got the, the picture to get the idea. And that's how the final look of the roof uh, looked like. 
looks better in person than a close-up picture. So next was, uh, I was gonna do, um, sorry, um, for the end walls. Now the end walls were pretty delicate. Um, so I used wax paper and glued the board directly on it as per the printed plan underneath. Again, that plan was done to scale. Um, so once done, it was, uh, it was framed. In other words, there's a piece that goes all around um, the outside and the inside. Um, then I was able to call, uh, to cut off all the extra, um, the extra that was left with the end walls. So I had to do that twice. So here's a, another uh, picture to guide me into the build of the end walls. Uh, those pictures were very useful. I mean, you can go with a plan, but um, pictures say a thousand words. <laughs> At this point, I needed to test the walls and the roof to make sure everything would fit right. Uh, so as you can see, it's a bit loose, the, like the roof is loose and everything is loose. Um, the assembling was gonna be done afterwards. Next was the floor. Uh, so I started with the primary floor beams and secured it with the secondary floor beams and added the diagonal floor braces. Uh, at this point, I'm still working with the plans that were scaled to 187. Um, if I'm not wrong, um, yeah, if I'm not wrong, the same plan, uh, like half the plan was the roof and half the plan was the floor. I then worked on the tracks and this was my first go at uh, installing tracks. Um, so the, uh, the tracks where I used were code 83 and the rails inside were code 70. Um, I had ordered the tie plates and spikes. Uh, the spikes kind of went on the wayside because there's no way I was going to be able to um, drill little holes and put that in. I tried, I think the first three spikes I took, they kind of flipped and I lost them. So I said, you know what? I'm not going through this. Uh, so basically I glued down the rails uh, onto the tie plates. And then I finished with uh, guard rails on both sides. They're not on the picture, but they're guard rails. So once my the, the, uh, the ties and the rails were done, I installed it on the floor that I had done that you see under. Now, of course, we all do mistakes. Um, I didn't know better, so I went with the plan and the plan showed um, boards all across um, the floor. And I thought the rails were on top of the boards until somebody mentioned, no, those during, when the engineers came in to um, look at the bridge, they drew the bridge as it was. So that's when the floor was done and the rails were removed. So I had to remove everything I had done, all the, um, all the boards and not kind of start over, but almost. So another test to make sure that the walls were flat and uh, that they fitted well. Now, for the abutments, uh, I decided to go with exactly what the plan showed. Uh, so I used, uh, I drew the outline, well, I drew the outline shown on the plan on a piece of foam, and then I cut the foam uh, exactly like, like it was. So the abutments were created with a foam base, 
and individual foam stones were glued to the base, um, as you can see, different sizes and different um, thickness. So the, abut the abutments were carved in the shape of the drawings on the plan. I then covered everything with plaster and once dried, I scraped the plaster uh, with the metal brush to remove the plaster on the rocks, leaving a mortar between the rocks only and, the, and at the same time giving the rocks some texture. I then completed the abutment by painting uh, the rocks with acrylic assorted colors and I finish it off with, uh, uh, with a wash. So another testing uh, for the placement of the abutments and the location of the bridge. Uh, the abutments were placed on my freelance layout and the blending was done when I did the scenery. So basically the bridge and the abutments uh, are, I would say, pretty prototypical. And you can see on the right-hand side, in, inside the bridge, um, I, I presume that was a toolbox. It, it is a box, but I guess it was a toolbox. Because in real life, there was a switch uh, that came out straight from the bridge. Uh, yeah, from the bridge. So the lever was inside the bridge. Now with all the work done to build this bridge, uh, I was disappointed that nobody would be able to see the details inside the covered bridge. So I needed to come up uh, with a solution. My first solution was to install tiny little inches on the roof uh on the roof and the wall so i could open the roof like tilt it open so people would be able to see the underneath of the roof and the walls but um i found out that uh, with the knee brace on the roof they would prevent me from lifting the roof so um and the thing is i had already uh, glued the walls down uh, to the floor so I had to unglue them and then glue the roof um, to the walls because my second um, idea, uh, which I, I had seen on the internet for buildings, um, people, some, well, the, 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 uh, the video I saw, the person had installed magnets to hold their buildings in place. There was magnets on their the building and there was magnets on um, on the layout, so the building was stuck there. Um, so that became my solution. So what I did is I installed two millimeter magnets. Those are really really tiny magnets. So I installed uh, two on either ends, and yeah. So I installed magnets under each end of the walls and another set of on the floor beams. This way I could remove the structure from the floor uh, for show and in case there was any derailment. And they're pretty strong. To finalize the area of the, for the bridge, I did some falls uh, in a river surrounded by static grass, bushes and weeds and I've been using a lot of Martin Wilberg's products, which I find very, they're great. They're not cheap, but uh, I mean, you don't put them all over your layout. You just put them sparsely around uh, and the rest is static grass. Um, I also added a trestle bridge, uh, which is also scratched. Um, because some of the freights <laughs> wouldn't be able to go through the covered bridge. Um, that, like I said, that bridge was built in 1889. So there's a few cars or locomotives that can't go through it. But uh, I mean, 
the main reason is I also have a double uh, mainline layout. So during operations, um, the right bridge is going to be very important. Um, on the trestle bridge, I have an electrical conduit uh, that you see in the front. And there's also two phone wires that go across. So this is what the final, uh, the final scene looks like. I think I spoke a bit too fast, but anyway, we're, we're not finished yet. Um, so some final thoughts. Uh, there was lots of research. Um, in high school, I hated history. Um, don't, if I'm not wrong, I skipped a few classes, if not many. Um, um, history is not my forte. Um, but going through all the, the research I did, I really got interested in that bridge. Um, it, there's a lot of history in it. And it was fun. So this project took five months from the day I, from the time I decided to do some research to the last blade of grass that, uh, that I placed. So the total cost of the project was about $280 Canadian. Uh, that's without the scenery. And I really enjoyed doing this project. Um, it was fun. Um, it wasn't a pain in the butt. Um, I took my time and I really enjoyed it. Like I said, the only downside is that all the hard work can can barely can't barely be seen. Um, that's the only downside because all that work is just covered by boards and a roof. So the idea of being able to remove that bridge um, from the floor was fantastic. Um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Um, I'll finish with a small video of my covered bridge and a video from Charles Fenton, which was filmed in 1950 with an eight millimeter camera. Um, enjoy it. And I'll be back after the video. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, I guess we've come up to the question period. Okay, Lloyd, that was brilliant. I, uh, let me get uh, my screen sorted here. Okay. Oh, that was excellent. That was excellent. Um, now, questions. Let's go over and have a look in, uh, in the chat and see what we've got. Anybody's got a question here for Lloyd, put it in the chat and we'll, uh, we shall get to it. Let's have a look at uh, Facebook first. What have they got over there? Uh, basically no questions, but there's uh, quite a few comments. Uh, wow, well done, Lloyd, and uh, very nice modeling. So uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a few bits and pieces there, mainly comments. Let's have a little look over in, uh, in YouTube. It's usually more in YouTube. So 
Uh, let's see. Um, oh, there's one here from uh, uh, an old friend. He's asking how many layers in that wall. Looks like Speed's going to build one of these, is he? So the, it's twelve layers. Like uh, there's um, what do we call it? Um, okay, you got the lattice, which is two. Um, the cords. Okay, let's start with the cords. There's three cords. There's uh, two lattice. There's two more cords, two lattice, and three more cords. So basically, the wall is 12 layers thick. So that's a lot of wood. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of timber in there. Well, I guess if uh, speed's going to make it, it'll probably be an end scale. So uh, it'll be half as much wood. I don't know if I would do that in N scale. <laughs> just an HO was pretty small. Uh, just, doing, uh, just doing that roof uh, pieces were so small. Um, Bernard Helen uh, says amazing work. Um, Mark Stafford. Oh, look, Mark's here from down in Melbourne in Australia. And he's asking, did they put ballast between or over the bridge? What I've seen and what I've researched, no, there is, you would be able to see the water underneath. So, no. Okay, so no ballast through that track. Uh, boom, 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 boom. There's another comment here. Someone says they saw this technique at the NER convention. Amazing way to build stone walls. So I think that was when you were doing your uh, abutments Abutment. with the with the stone walls there. There's another comment here. Wow, great job. Um, and uh, there's another comment here. That's important to take apart so you can clean your track. So I guess they're talking about the the way you come up with being able to take the uh, the top of the, the bridge off and, uh, and access the track if you have a derailment or clean clean track when that's need to be done or uh, or any other reason. Yeah, well, um, when I decided to build it to scale, um, that bridge is a hundred and uh, what is it, one hundred and sixty-seven feet long. So basically, in HO, it came out to about twenty-three inches. So yeah, that's that's a long span if you get some type of derailment inside that bridge. Um, but uh, like I said, the main reason I wanted to be able to remove the roof or uh, the structure is mainly to show people what was inside. I had people come over last weekend. Um, I had an open house all day and I was, the fun part was being able just to take the part, um, the structure and turn it upside down and be able to see every, every bits and pieces. I tried to, um, to put those wooden pegs, like try to make pegs. Do you know how small that is in Asia? <laughs> <laughs> no. And and the thing is, the fact that it's hidden behind the walls, you can't see it. So I said, you know what? I'm not putting any pegs in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I did try though. It was three pegs per um, when you had the pieces that did the crossing. So you had three pegs in there. Yes. And, no. <laughs> it was way it's, too hard. Sometimes, you know, crazy or no, no, no. But the reason I did that, um, that bridge is all my struck. Um, okay, I'm I'm working towards my MMR, and um, for the structure, um, AP, one of them has to be a bridge. And. Uh, if you remember at the beginning, I had my first covered bridge. Well, I basically glued tracks on on wood, and that's not how you'd probably lose points for that. Yeah. <laughs> or you're yeah. not going to get good points. So I decided to really work on something that's very prototypical, and I've got two bridges, so I know that I'm I'm pretty good uh, with everything I've got now. Oh, excellent. It, it was fun. I, I love that part of building stuff. So that's like five months of not working on my layout. 
Well, I uh, I guess that uh, that model will score highly in the prototypical section of the uh, the scenery AP uh, scoring. But uh, just going back to those magnets again, I was uh, I was thinking when you actually brought them up, uh, you could maybe put a magnet on one side and then just a steel pin for it to hook down on, and that might make it uh, a little easier to put in. But the other point was as well, if you used them on any other buildings on your layout, because I thought that that'd be a great way of being able to get a layout, a, a building to actually seat flat. Because when you put a, a, a building in, you know, so as you know, sometimes the grounds, the, the, the base is slightly at a level or whatever. And, uh, and you, you get that little gap running around the outside of the building. Well, with those magnets that would pull yeah. it down. It, not only for that is that if you're going to put lights in the building and something happens all you got to do is take out like just remove the building do what you have to do and just set it back exactly at the same place yeah it's, yeah um, i found that very easy and and the thing is with that wall i um, the fact that i only had like three cords to work uh, sorry two cords to work on and drill a small hole the magnet had to be very, very small. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. 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 So, like I said, I've got two on each end, and I'll probably put two in the middle also. But it's it's pretty steady, uh, sturdy. Um, okay. So Especially with a, a building like that that's built out of all out of timber. I mean, even if you got a breeze or something in the room, if you had a window open, it could uh, it could move nah. it quite easily. But with those magnets there. It ain't going anywhere. No, it's not going anywhere. And uh, even uh, I had uh, the video of my train going through. One of the cars is pretty long, and it kind of hit the edge of the bridge. And that's because um, my curve starts a little bit too close to the bridge. So I'm going to have to redo that part of the, the track. But... Um, when it hit, I mean, the bridge didn't even budge. So. Right, right. Oh, I've got one more question or a few more questions that come up here. Um, Andy was asking, uh, now you can tell he's from London, what was the original purpose of putting the roof on the bridge? So I guess I'll let you explain to Andy why you'd have the roof on the bridge. It's to protect the wood from rain, snow, um, that's what I read. <laughs> so I, I, I w that's that's where my knowledge stops when it comes to tra to anything that has to do with trains. But I did read somewhere where it protects the wood um, from the snow and yeah, and the rain. Snow and ice and and bits and pieces. I, I guess you get a bit of snow up around that way as well. Oh yeah, there's a lot of snow up in New Hampshire. It's, it's it's a bit like us. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. I know where it is now. So uh, I'm when everything is back to kind of back to normal. That's a place I'd like to go see now. Since I got so involved in that bridge, uh, I need to really go look at it. Oh, that'll be a that'll be a nice trip when uh, you can uh, get across the border. I don't know what it's like. Uh, at the moment in the states but uh yeah here in australia we, we can't get across borders so anyway uh let's move on uh bernard's put a question in here what would have you done differently if you had to build this again so what would you have done differently in this project hmm hmm oh it's made him think it, now. <laughs> yeah I, like for example when I, when I wanted to um, have the, the roof being removed or the, the structure being removed from the main floor, I should have thought about, about it first because I had glued the wall down and having to remove the wall afterwards, uh, it was a pain in the butt. Um, but the structure in itself, uh, there's not much I would redo. Uh, I'd probably do the same way. Um, I would probably learn more about weathering the roof because, um, I mean, it looks okay, but it's, 
it would need a better weathering job, put it this way. But the rest, uh, no. Uh, like, I really took my time, like, five months to do this. Um, no, uh, I did all my research before getting started. I had so many pictures and that I had pretty much all the information needed. Cool. cool. Um, there's a few more comments here or... Uh... Brad Cranes way. actually said he saw that bridge last weekend and it's beautiful. So mm. apparently uh, there's someone that's seen it recently and it's up and it's uh, it's it's in good nick. Um, mm. Split Rock says it sounded like a challenge to me as well. And um, here's a, a, a poignant question uh, uh, coming from Sparky. And uh, I can I know where he's coming from with this because I I have the attention span of a gnat as everyone knows. Uh, the latest rabbit hole that I'll find, I go running down and uh, and then forget everything else that I've been doing or starting. So uh, anyway, uh, Sparky said it took you five months to do it. How did you keep yourself focused on the project? Oh, I'm really focus all the time <laughs> uh, no i i i love the attention uh, the attention to details um and when i was doing the wall okay like for doing the wall took um let's say to do once one lattice okay just one um yeah one lattice well that took one night and then i would do the other one the next night and having, I guess, having to do, having to do a lot of things, like having to work on Photoshop to shrink the the, the plans, um, cutting your wood, um, you're always doing something different. It's not always the same thing you're doing. So it's the same thing when I do my scenery, um, do bits and pieces, then I'll go do something else. When I say it took me five months, it's not five months nonstop. Uh, I was doing other things too. Uh, I was working on on a building. I was working on the diorama. Um, the only thing I, w I wasn't doing was electricity, <laughs> which, I, <laughs> which I should be doing. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, I've got so much to do on my layout that I, I change everything uh, like one day I'll do one thing, the next day I'll do something else. Yep. Or I'll work on, like I was working on the bridge and let's say I was doing the end piece. Once I did one, uh, I'll wait till tomorrow to do the next one. You know, because if you want to rush into it, that's where mistakes happen. Yes. I, I, I can't say that I, I haven't done any mistakes. The end wall, the first time I did it, um, uh, it kind of came apart so I said no that's not how I'm going to do it <laughs> um, so yeah I did a few mistakes but I mean nothing um, nothing big and if you ask me if I was if I was to do this bridge over sure I would do it over um, probably the same way too cool. but I love what I did it's, a, no, it's, no, fun. it's, it's brilliant brilliant work and uh it always, I, I always get interested um, when you do a, or anybody does a prototype building. I'm a bit of a history buff and I love the research, the, the research part of it uh, at the beginning to uh, to get going. But uh, what we got here, Speed's put a comment in. He said, are you so glad there's no lumber touching the ground in the Nibia? Uh, to tell you the truth, Speed, after watching that, that uh, tour a couple of NMRA X's ago of of Nanibian rail, I don't think there's much of anything touching the ground bar dirt. So, uh, That's right. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty sparse. It was like watching, it was like, uh, I, I, I watched it and I thought I was watching a, an obsession on the moon or something like that. But uh, I don't, anyway. I don't know why he wants me to go over and help him with the scenery. There's yeah. no scenery to be done. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lloyd, there's no one can spread dirt like you. So you, 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 you you've got that knack. So, that's why he wants you down there. Um, yeah. Okay, let me go back over to Facebook and see if we've got any uh, questions there. 
people at Facebook have they uh, put anything in? Uh, no, it's just a lot of comments over there saying a great job, very nice. Um, so yeah, we'll go back over to YouTube and no one's added anything there. So Lloyd, another brilliant little clinic. Um, and it's always interesting to see uh, the structures that you're building. It always, um, always find it entertaining with the, uh, the interiors that you do and, and the like. So I look forward to seeing uh, some more stuff in your next project. And thank you very much for being here at this NMRIX. It was a pleasure. It was nice seeing you. Cheers. We might just duck over and we'll have a look if anybody's in the uh, in the um, breakout rooms. So uh, we'll have a look. It's looking all. Oh, hang on, it's looking pretty busy over in Speed's JMRI Ops room. I think he's <laughs> doing a an impromptu clinic over there, or or showing people how his uh, his ops session and his dispatching works online, so uh, you can do online ops. So uh, I don't know if Brad's still there, but uh, I think we're about ready to uh, wrap this up for November. It's been another bumper, uh, another bumper four hours. We had uh, had some great little clinics there, some. Uh, useful information i hope for everyone so uh, we're all going to be going over to the uh, breakout room so uh, if you're on youtube down in the uh, description there there's a link that will take you to the breakout room uh, at the moment speed's holding court in his ops room uh, but uh, yeah you're welcome to come over there we're going to join in brad and i are going to head over there now and um, we'll wrap this up for this month and uh, what do we got coming up next month you got any news there Brad um, all I can tell everyone is uh, we're going to be a couple of weeks early on the 18th I believe it is um, of December just to bring it forward of Christmas so yeah um, if anyone's out there and really keen to give a clinic um, reach out to speed on on Facebook and either speed or myself will get in touch and try to line something up for you to fit into the coming shows excellent excellent so uh well i ain't got much more to say uh thanks everyone and uh we'll see you all next month on the 18th or over in the chat room catch us all later okay. Did you want me, Marty, Mar Marty, come back. Don't get a sandwich just yet. You want me to do another one? Okay. All right. Hey, everybody out there in uh, Facebook. No, where are we at? Oh, we're in NMA or NMRA X land. This is your old buddy, Lionel Strang from uh, Modeler's Life. Uh, you just, I uh, bet uh, Modeler's Life, uh, uh, modelersLife.com. You just go there and you'll hear all kinds of podcasts. Anyways, Marty wanted me to come on here and remind you that if you like, excuse me, I need my green sunglasses for this part. He wanted me to come on here, wanted me to come on here, waste your time and tell you that if you want to see more of these NMRAX videos, uh, just click, uh, make sure you subscribe. And then you click this little bell icon, like you always hear Ron from Ron's Trains and Things. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things. He always says, click the little bell icon, and then you get notifications after you subscribe. How much am I getting paid for this, Marty? Well, do I get a check or something? Wouldn't it be easier if they just mailed? I'm thinking it would be easier if you just mailed the videos to the individuals. But, you know, Marty knows better. See ya. Modeler's Life. Follow Modeler's Life, too. Bye.